The Building Better Business Podcast is the best place to learn how to take your business to the next level. It's no longer enough to earn good profits. You need to develop a network of connections as well as use all types of marketing to your advantage that will put you over the edge. Hosted by me, Steve Eschbach, a financial executive with decades of experience in dealing with businesses and business people, we'll learn how this all comes together. Join me and my expert guests as we delve into the many facets of owning the business and how to become a good, caring business owner. Listen how making a difference in your community can attract all sorts of clientele, which in turn will build you a better business. Greetings of the day, my fellow listeners, and welcome to another edition of Building Better Businesses. I am your host. My name is Steve Eschbach. I own a franchise here in Chicagoland called Transworld Business Advisors. Uh, My Naperville branch is one of eight of them in the Chicagoland area, and I'm also one of about 225 uh, in our global network that spans 15 countries. Uh, Primarily, we do three basic things. One of them, of course, is to help business owners confidentially sell. Uh, and match them up with qualified buyers. So we're looking for that exit strategy development, if you will. Uh, We can also help business owners uh, expand through acquisition. So if you'd rather acquire than sell, we can help you do that. We also do franchise sales. Uh, We have a number of brand names we represent. There are eight of them in the United Franchise Group family, plus we represent many others. And we also do franchise development. So if you're a business owner looking to expand via the franchise development model, we have a sister subsidiary that can help you do that for a heck of a lot less than you could be trying to do that all by your own. And we do everything from marketing to legal to discovery days, to finding locations and et cetera. So we go the whole nine yards with you on that. But today we're going to shift gears a little bit. We're going to talk again about building better businesses. And this time we're going to focus on family businesses and branding. I'm delighted to have Megan Lynch with me here today. And uh, let me go through the the intro I have for her because it's uh, pretty impressive. So Megan is the uh, CEO of Six Point creative, a brand strategy agency that helps family businesses double their business without losing their existing customers or values. As part of her mission to help family businesses break through the growth plateaus, Megan has served as an expert advisor to clients in a wide range of industries, from fast casual restaurants to industrial manufacturers. Megan was named Enterprising Woman of the Year in 2019 and enjoys testing her limits as an endurance runner. Well, that's exciting. Well, welcome to the show, Megan. I can't wait to hear more about your story. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. So first of all, tell me a little bit about uh, about your business, Six Point Creative. Give me a couple, three minutes about what that is that you do to assist uh, family owners and brand identity. Yeah, so Six Point was really, you know, our whole core focus is on kind of like family owned businesses because they kind of, I think, represent the more like softer and complex side of business that kind of combines the heart and the values with running a business. Um, Early on, I I joined a family business center when I was looking for just more support as a CEO. And I found myself just surrounded with all these awesome companies with people who were so passionate about the business that they were in. And they were also really passionate about their employees and their communities and their values. And for me, it was just like, oh, like this is the kind of business that I love and I can get behind. So I spent a lot of time both learning from them and then also talking to them about some of the the challenges that they were facing. And I felt like a big one that I continued to hear was that a lot of family businesses have grown organically, you know, sometimes even for generations, just by kind of putting their head down and focusing on the product and focusing on relationships and just doing that work. But then they kind of get to a point where that isn't enough anymore. And the business needs to keep growing in order to continue to to be there, to leave a legacy for the next generation. But they've kind of tapped out the organic growth that they can reach. And so they're kind of at a tipping point in the business where they just need to do things a little bit differently, but they're starting to enter some unknown territory of like, well, you know, how do we do marketing and branding for, you know, maybe really the first time ever in a big way? Or, you know, do we enter this market? Is this viable for us? Or, you know, what does online digital look like for a company that has traditionally never touched that? So really what we found was that we could put together a process and a system to help them really look at all of those growth opportunities that they have, because oftentimes 
they were getting stuck, just not because they didn't have opportunity to grow, but because they almost had like too many different opportunities to grow and they didn't know which one to go after. And then just starting to just take them through the steps of that, of getting them the data that they needed, helping them craft a strategy, helping them create a marketing plan and budget and figuring out you know, what that return on investment needs to look like and how to build a team and hold people accountable. So start to just kind of systematically put all those pieces into place for them. And um, I think it really started filling a niche kind of like a, a hole. You know, there's lots of people providing services and and these companies needed those, but they weren't quite ready to buy those services yet because they still hadn't figured out exactly, you know, what does that big picture look like and who do I need and when and and what does this growth strategy look like? I know in the many businesses that I've encountered in doing what I do, and I've been doing it for five or six years, and even be before that, uh, sometimes uh, reaching outside to the subject matter expert who does a little bit more of that niche area, we're talking about branding and marketing, uh, is often helpful. And plus, that changes over time. And uh, you and I both know that uh, the social media platforms seem to change their whatever you want to call it, their algorithms or whatever, uh, almost on a constant basis just to keep you on your toes. But we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Tell me a little bit more about your company, Six Point. And is it a big team? Is it uh, you have like thousands of people on the planet or you have a small little niche in your Western Massachusetts area? So we have a, a pretty small team. We're about 10 people and primarily brand strategists and project managers is kind of like our the, the key uh, role that we play for, for clients. Um, and then we also have a network of subject matter experts that we'll, we can connect clients to for you know things like SEO and design. But, but really our core focus is helping companies really focus in on that strategy and really be able to, to efficiently execute a growth plan. We've also, we used to just be in person in Western Massachusetts, but um, COVID forced us to um, go remote and we've really leaned into that. It's been actually great for us. So now um, our team is spread out from Texas to Idaho to Tennessee. Um, so it's allowed us to kind of have a lot more diversity within within our company and I think has brought a lot of benefits in terms of the expertise that we can attract and retain beyond our own kind of geographic footprint. Yeah, absolutely. From sea to shining sea. Exactly. So let's do this. Let's kind of rewind the videotape. I want to take you down memory lane. So we're going to look back to your childhood, uh, picture yourself, you're five years old, you're jumping on that tricycle, you're bicycling up and down the street. What's going through your mind back then? What were your aspirations when you were a young child? And tell us a little bit of how your family and your parents particularly if, uh, influenced you to where you are today. Yeah. So, I mean, it's kind of funny. I'm sure that they probably look at me and go like, I have no idea how she got into business. My dad is an Episcopal priest. Uh, my mom is a teacher. And so business was pretty much like as far from our family <laughs> as you could get, like nobody, you know, not just not in the plans. I was always a, a huge reader. I love books, love literature. I went to school actually for English literature. I have a master's degree in English literature. Um, and, and my parents really instilled, you know, I was you know, again, probably as that five-year-old, I remember my dad reading me chapter books, you know, in bed at night, um, you know, that were probably like way over my head, but I just was so excited to be able to spend time with him and just kind of like try to imagine these big things that, that were happening. So that was kind of always a big, I thought that I was going to be a teacher as well. Um, and that I would kind of follow in that path. And yeah, I think now my kind of standard line is like now, instead of reading books, I read business <laughs> <laughs> um, that like looking for patterns and kind of doing that sort of work. I, at least in my own mind, that there's um, a lot of overlaps there. But yeah, it was definitely like an unexpected path for me. Yeah. So a couple of comments I have based on your commentary there. Number one, you and I both know that readers develop leaders. So that's good. And number two, you probably don't even think of yourself as this, but you are, in fact, a teacher because your expertise in helping families with branding and, uh, you know, establishing themselves in the marketplace. Yeah, you're a consultant. Yeah, you're a marketing expert. But when you boil it down, you really are a teacher helping them out. So kudos to you. You got what you thought you were going to be, but maybe quite a little bit different than what you really thought it would be. But so exactly. that's good for you. Yeah. 
So there are some topics here that I want to go through because they're quite interesting. And I got to tell you, um, I'm a finance and accounting expert. Marketing was clearly not um, uh, my focus when I was a five-year-old pedaling a bike. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've come to realize now in the six years that I've owned Transworld, plus even before that, uh, messaging is critically important. I used to do investor relations. And I'm telling you, if you can't develop the message, you're not going to bring your audience to the table. But let's talk about a few of these topics here that I see on your uh, single page sheet. Uh, the first one has to do with the fears holding family businesses back from growth. Why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about that? And you have some specific examples to represent that. That would be interesting. Yeah, sure. I, mean, I think one of the big fears that hold family businesses back is really just this, this idea of loss, a fear of loss. You know, I think that one of the clients that we worked with, a cheese manufacturer, a second generation company, one of their big fears, they, they knew that they had to grow. They were, you know, kind of at maybe be like a $3 million size company. They know in the cheese industry, you really need to be kind of like a $10 million producer in order to be sustainable and scalable. Um, so it was a really clear operational goal that they were going to get to. But their big fear was that, that people would think that if they actually kind of started to match their brand to that size, then that they would, um, people would think that they had sold out that they'd gotten acquired by some big company. There's a ton of consolidation in that industry or that they had kind of abandoned their values as, as a company around sustainability. That's a huge part of, of who they are and kind of connection to the land. And so they were kind of like at this point where they were scared to grow because they were afraid that either their reputation or their existing customers or the people who got them to where they are would all of a sudden think that, oh no, they've abandoned, they've changed, that the kind of word on the street would be that they weren't kind of living up to their values. And again, I mean, this is, it's both why I love family businesses that this even enters their mind. I think it's it's awesome. And it's also, you can see how quickly it stops them from making a courageous decision that they need to make this huge leap to, you know, triple the size of their company if they're afraid of what people will say if they grow. And I think that that kind of of pattern and that kind of fear is way more common than you might think among family businesses because relationships are so important to them and their their legacy, their reputation is everything. You know, it's their name on the business, their their family. Um, so it's not a small thing; it's a really personal thing. So I'm not going to let you stop there. What was the solution? How did you uh, how did you calm their fears down? How did you alleviate that concern? Yeah, so I mean, I think like a big thing was just kind of showing them how it's done technically, you know, that really it just becomes a communications challenge, right? You know, I mean, if you, if you don't want people to make up some story about, about your brand, you need to, you know, to your point, you need to right. put the story out there that you want them to be talking about. You need to tell them the truth and you need to get that story out there in an efficient way. You need to, you know, not surprise your current customers with your plans. You need to pull them closer and engage them in your plans. So I think communication really becomes the answer. And so, so just showing them what an efficient and effective communication plan around their growth would look like, all of a sudden now kind of like, okay, they can take a breath. They can see that there is a solution to this problem. But I think also a big piece was that you know, our whole thing is that we don't, we don't minimize these fears. When we hear them, we kind of lean into them and listen to them and say, like, you're worried about something that's really important to you and something that, that actually could be a problem if we didn't get in front of it. So, you know, let's just have to pass forward and, and show how this would go. And then I think the other big piece was really doing a deep dive into kind of the DNA of their brand. It's kind of what we call like the brand, like do not alter. So like, these are the things that if they changed about the brand, it would actually move the company backwards instead of moving them forwards. And so we just did a really, really deep dive into exactly what their customers, the market, internally, you know, all of those things that people wouldn't want to change about the brand that couldn't change about the brand and just made sure that those were guardrails around any work that we did together. And as they engage other folks into the brand, as they grow, as they hire, um, that those guardrails are communicated clearly to everyone to make sure that as they grow, they don't lose that soul. They don't lose, you know, those critical values that make them who they are. 
Well, you just touched on the next topic. You were talking about uh, three ways family businesses can double revenue without selling their souls. So you just talked about that. Is there any little expansion you could have on that uh, other than what you were just describing regarding the uh, holding businesses back from growth? Yeah, I mean, I think a huge thing is to to really start focusing on the right parts of their marketing. I think right now a ton of businesses, again, it's especially businesses that have not really done a lot of marketing in the past or, or kind of intentional brand work in the past is that they end up putting the emphasis on areas of their brand and marketing that actually aren't impactful. You know, they'll spend tons of money on brochures and catalogs and, you know, their website and their social media, but they will neglect things like sales presentations, you know, employee training, you know, making sure that the pieces, the the highly personal, highly frequent touch points that you have with members of the public or internally or customers or prospective customers, those are the things that are really going to have a major impact on how people remember you and how they talk about you. You know, your brand is your reputation. So you need to make sure those things are dialed in before you start really investing a lot in all of those other, what I would consider more like ancillary, you know, less personal, less frequent, you know, much quicker touch points that are not going to have, you know, they're nice to haves, but they're not going to have the biggest impact on your brand. So it it becomes a huge head shift for people to actually start thinking about marketing and branding. There's probably more things that they do in the day-to-day that are affecting their brand, whether they know it or not, than what they might traditionally put into that category, if that makes sense. So I crack a smile here because I think your point is well taken. The one thing I learned early in my career was the term executive summary. Mm -hmm. And early in my career, I was bringing in these three inch binders to demonstrate the point I wanted to bring across when in fact, a single page executive summary is where you're at. So to your point, I think you need to kind of cover the three, four or five bullets that are most essential and have all that backup if needed. You can bring it out later but you got to be able to get the key messages out there. So that's a point well taken. So we talked a little bit about DNA. And uh, the question I have here is how to uncover your family business's brand DNA. Now you're not taking a a scalpel and cutting skin to go deep down inside to find that DNA. How do you do it on a a family business perspective? How do you get that DNA to kind of bubble up, if you will, so you can better understand it and guide them accordingly? Yeah. So a big piece of it is to actually, you know, as crazy as this sounds, actually talk to your customers. You know, this is something that it seems like every business should be doing it. It seems obvious, but again, most of the businesses that I talk to, this is not something that they're doing. Even if they know that they should be doing it, they're not really getting out there and talking to their customers on a regular basis. And so, you know, what we usually find is if you do, you know, a dozen customer interviews with with customers that have been with you for a while who know your company and your brand, you can start to see patterns emerge from those conversations. And again, you're not, you're not just kind of doing like a, like a customer survey on, are you happy with our service? Like, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about a deep conversation to understand what's going on in their life. How does your brand fit into their life? What are things going on that maybe your brand doesn't touch into and, and just really understand who they are as, as people And then also really understand their relationship with the brand, how they're thinking about it from their perspective. And all of a sudden, you really start to see these very distinct patterns emerge, and it almost becomes self-evident. It's... It's a little strange, like how start, you know, you'll see like the exact same words being used in, you know, 10 of the 12 interviews. And you don't really need to do more than that. We also see diminishing returns after that point. You know, you could do 24 but you're really not going to learn anything majorly right. different. So it's such a simple thing to do. And, and it's one that most companies either don't quite know how to do effectively or just, you know, it stays on the wish list again of like nice to have, but it's not really critical to our day to day. So we never do it. And they lose out on a huge opportunity for connection and relevance and messaging, even innovation by not taking that step. Yeah. So I'm now going to think twice when I call my cell phone carrier with an issue and they say, if you don't mind, give us one or two minutes after the call, 
a three question survey, same with credit card companies, same with social media marketplaces. I don't have to mention names, but I think everyone knows what we're talking about. But I, I totally agree with you on that one, Megan, because um, there's nothing better than getting the critical feedback. I mean, you're doing yourself a disservice if you believe that your customers are thinking one thing when in fact they're thinking another. And if that goes too far, uh, along the path there, it's tough to get it back, right? And is that what you're saying? Exactly. And also, I mean, again, if you're looking for for what is our brand DNA, what is the thing that makes us most valuable? I mean, one of the definitions of brand that that I really like and, and I use a lot is that you're connecting your company values, the value that your company is creating with what your customer values. And you need to make sure that those two things are aligned. And that is branding, that alignment is branding. And mm-hmm. so if you don't know, if you know what you're creating that's valuable, but you don't know what your customers value or how they're thinking about it, then there's absolutely no way that you can identify properly right. what your brand is because you're miss you're only hearing one side of the story. You're only, you know, and you can't you can't read the label on your own bottle, right? Yeah, I use an example of we uh, we worked with a, a company and they were a hundred percent sure that they were hiring us to do a marketing campaign for them, that that was what they wanted. They wanted an awareness campaign. They thought that was going to drive sales of their private label brand. And, and I was like, I know, you know, and they, and they just wanted it now. It's like, come on, just, just work on this thing. And I was like, look, let us do these interviews. I just want to double check that this is really what you need. By the end of the interviews, we could show them, you know, in 10 of 12 interviews, the thing that everybody's bringing up is we don't have enough education about the brand. We actually need to be, you know, they're, they're in a retail environment and they need to be educating the frontline employees about how to sell the brand. It wasn't about consumer awareness. It was about their own people knowing how to sell the brand properly. And so what could have been a multi-million dollar ad campaign that probably would not have moved the needle ended up turning into, you know, a $50,000 investment in employee training, which all of a sudden now is making a huge difference in sales. And so again, it's just, it's solving the right problem. And, and if you just jump to the solution and you think, you know, and you don't bother asking, you know, again, it's the quickest way to go broke. I mean, go ahead. Like we, you know, I think any, any agency, if you said you called them up and said, we want to order an ad campaign, they're going to run the campaign if that's what you're asking for. And so I think just kind of walking through companies, you know, you need to know what you're asking for. You need to know what you're buying um, because otherwise people will just, they'll be happy to take your money. (laughs) And and that goes to a huge component, I think, of you and I and, and many other small business owners is that relationship building is key. And it sounds counterintuitive, but if it's not going to buy your services, at least guiding them in the direction to help them out is critically important. I have time for one more question. And the last bullet item on your interview topic list has to do with rebranding. And any of the conversations that we've had, is there a different element when you talk about rebranding? We were talking about brand identity and getting comfortable with pushing that forward and taking the right step with respect to brand identification. Does that whole game change when you're talking about rebranding? No, I mean, the fundamentals don't change. I think that one of the big questions that companies had, again, I mean, it becomes kind of like the be careful what you ask for. So I think some companies jump to the fact that they need to rebrand, that they need to, let's say, change their name, change their logo. You know, we're hitting some plateau. And so we need some big overt change. And sometimes that's what you need, you know, depending, you know, maybe you're, you need to appeal to a really different market and you're going to be in a very different competitive set, but sometimes it's more of like, nuance work that you need, or that again, changing your logo or your name might actually set you backwards. So I think again, just the process doesn't change, but I think it's really being open to what is the best solution for what we're trying to achieve with the business and not just jumping to the solution before you've kind of aligned each of those things and kind of answered the question systematically and done the work. You know, our one of our mantras at Six Point is slow is smooth and smooth is fast. And so I'm just such a big believer in doing that work, taking that time. And then when you get to execution, it's obvious and quick and seamless. 
Right. Yeah. So that uh, it's kind of funny, but it I, I think what you're saying and, and kind of what I'm hearing is that preparation is key before you take that big gi- gigantic leap forward, because, you know, you could be trying to jump over the wrong chasm if you don't uh, do that prep work thoroughly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And you could be making the wrong move. You know, you don't need to leap out into the void. <laughs> you know, you really need to be solving some other issues. So. Um, so, yeah. That's key. Well, unfortunately, Megan, we've run out of time. Is there anything that our questions and your answers haven't covered that you want our audience to know about? No, I think we covered a lot of ground. Um, if uh, folks are interested in either having a conversation with me or or getting any of the tools, um, I've got some some tools that kind of allow you to kind of do that deep dive into where you're spending right. your money and what you should be focused on. We've got those available for your listeners at our website, sixpointcreative.com. That's S-I-X-P-O-I-N-T creative.com backslash better businesses. So they can go ahead and, and download some of those resources. And that's it. Yeah. Well, you, you took away my last question because that was going to be my last question. How do we find out more about you and your business and your services to assist business owners? So you covered that very, very well. And uh, mm-hmm. Kudos to you for making sure that point comes across before I ask it. So good for you. <laughs> Megan, thanks so much. I think uh, your insights were valuable. Listeners, I hope you uh, got a couple of nuggets or two to kind of help your businesses going forward. If not, you know where to go to find out more. And thank you so much, Megan, for your time and uh, sharing your uh, experience, expertise, and uh, insights to assist businesses become better. And audience, thank you for listening. As you know, there are many different episodes in in addition to this one. So uh, keep on listening. Keep on watching for new topics. We'll probably have Megan back again because I'm sure she'll learn some more things in short order to kind of share with us. So thanks again, Megan. Thanks again, audience, and uh, have a good rest of the day. 